Hello, folks. I am Rebecca Adams, and we are back again with Free to Soar. And I have the wonderful Becky Vermeer. Oh! Yes, <laughs> Mrs. Doubtfire. Here she is, folks. <laughs> How is life treating you? It's it's fine. It's life, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, has, I'm familiar with it. <laughs> <laughs> it has its ups and downs, right? <laughs> it does. It's a big roller coaster. Oh, yes, very much so. So yeah. how are you doing for your sock inventory? What are you going to share with us tonight? You know, I have socks galore. <laughs> but I have a pair of socks that I'll share with you tonight that incorporates multiple things that i love okay yeah so we'll start here at the toesies <laughs> oh boy yeah. down here at the toesies yes what you will see is a jeep grill oh yes <laughs> <laughs> over here on the side of the footsie it'll tell you if you didn't know that that that's a jeep <laughs> sock. then Let's go up here to the top and we see this lovely, oh, this lovely Jeep. Oh, look at that. At the On beach. The beach. Yeah. And you love the beach too. I love the beach. I love the Jeep. It's my blue is my favorite color. <laughs> this is all around a fantastic pair of socks. And how often do you wear that pair? I don't know. I can't really tell you how often I wear any pair because in the summertime, I don't wear socks at all. Yeah. And so one of the things I like about fall is it starts to get cool. And I'm like, oh, I'm going for my flip flops to my socks. <laughs> but I have a huge drawer full. And so I have to shake the drawer up all the time because otherwise I'm wearing the same pairs of socks over and over again. Exactly. So everything gets kind of recycled in there from time to time. So well, how big I can't tell you how often I wear them. Okay, well, how big is this drawer exactly? I actually have two. <laughs> <laughs> I have one drawer that's completely full of all my fancy socks. And then my second drawer is a combination of my fancy socks and then plain old, like, white socks or black socks. You know, plain old boring socks. Why would you wear white or black socks, Becky? I don't very often, to be honest with you, but sometimes if I'm laying around the house and I need a pair of socks I'll throw on a boring pair of socks why would you do that why not throw on a pair of fun socks make you smile well, most of the time it's a pair of fun socks okay but sometimes sometimes okay. I wear like a pair of black socks that just you've already got me yawning <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what would you do us a favor Next, sure. time you want to just pick out a pair of socks and throw them on, and you're going to go laying around at your house. Pick out a fun pair of socks <laughs> just for us, okay? Well, you know, in my mind, the fun socks are for when I go out in public. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know how people have their go out, they go out clothes, and then they have their sweatpants. Yep. Yeah. So they wear their sweatpants at home. If I got on the sweatpants, sometimes it's the door. Bull, door, da, 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 dull boring black socks that's how that'll go okay but look at look at it this way one one last piece to try to convince you <laughs> <laughs> it won't take much because i'd rather wear my fun socks anyway <laughs> okay so you know you talk about self-care and how important yeah. self-care is hey who cares if you're just laying around the house bring a smile to your face because you need it while you're laying there relaxing, right? That's true. Why do you think you have? I have a drawer and a half full of fun socks. <laughs> Hello. It's not like it's going to be the last pair, clean pair you have before you no, go no. out the next time. No. I could probably wear a different pair of socks every day for a year and not wear the same pair of socks. <laughs> okay. It's probably exaggerating, but definitely six months. Wow. Becky. There's no doubt six months. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll tell you what, one of these days you count your socks and I'll count my earrings. How's that? Oh my. I don't know that I can count that high. I don't know that I can either, but I could try. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me see your earrings tonight. What you got going on there? Okay, so I got to take them both off at the same time and show them to you. It's the only way I'm going to get it done. 
because otherwise it's not going to make any sense. I love these things. They were given to me. They are real turquoise. Those are pretty. I love the color. I do too. And I wish my camera, let me see if I can get it to clear up a little bit. But you can see the veins in there mm -hmm. and everything. But look, they're not the same size. Right. So I was wearing they have to be. <laughs> well, I was wearing them one time at work because I just love these earrings. And somebody that was OCD came up to me, one uh -oh. of my friends, and they said, Your earrings aren't the same size. That drives me crazy. I'm like, but I like the earrings. I know they're not the same <laughs> size. And she said, I can't look at you. It drives me crazy. You don't have to look at me. You don't have to look at my earrings. <laughs> but I just love these. I have loved turquoise ever since the first time I saw them. Yeah. Saw, saw turquoise anything, any kind of turquoise jewelry. I just go nuts over it. Yeah. You so. know, a little known fact about earrings that you and I have in common. What? That would drive somebody with OCD crazy. Oh, yes, our three. <laughs> I have three holes on the right side and two holes on the left. And I believe you do as well. I do. And you know, the more I thought about that, after you said that uh, several episodes, many episodes back, and I thought, you know what? You were the culprit that got me started on it. Because <laughs> I, I could never remember. I had a customer when I worked retail who had three ears pierced uh, or three piercings on one ear and two on the other. And I said, oh, I love that. She said, oh, it's wonderful. Because then when you lose an earring, it's no big deal. That can be your third earring up there on that one ear. And I said, I love it. I'm going to do that. And I did. <laughs> and it was you that started the whole thing. But until you said that, I did not remember that that was you. <laughs> Because I remember standing there at the crisis center and I said, oh, you've lost an earring, you know, and he said, nope, I didn't. I, only, I have two over here, three over here and I have two over there. Oh, really? Why would you do that? And I, we started it. Yeah. And I'd forgotten that years and years. And I had forgotten that. You're welcome. <laughs> But yes, we both end up, we're both Rebecca and we both have three piercings on the right ear and two on the left. So yeah, <laughs> there you go. We're like a set of bookends. We are. <laughs> <laughs> and if we stand back to back, the, the, oh, well, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be too confusing. It would be. Yes, it would. <laughs> so where did we leave off with our last episode, ma'am? Well, we've been talking about things that bug us. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I've reduced the topic to tonight. Things that bug us. Okay. <laughs> Last time we talked about it, I think it was things that get our ire up. Yes. And then I think the, the other time we talked about it, it was pet peeves or something. But tonight we're just going to continue talking about things that bug us. You know, one thing that bugs <laughs> me is mosquitoes when I go out with my dog at night or in the morning. Yeah. yeah. You know, I have, I have one way, one easy way to get rid of them. What's that? You take a container that is, that can tolerate fire and you put coffee in there. Just, just like you haven't fixed the coffee. It's not like used grounds. It's straight from the coffee can or coffee container and you set it on fire. You light it. And they don't, yeah, they don't like being oh, yeah. around that. And you have it right next to you, keeps them away. Huh. So that's one thing that bugs me is mosquitoes. I look. I like didn't a, know that you could burn coffee, actually. I didn't either. But I, I look, and and if you run my, your hand over my arm, it feels like I'm a meth addict. <laughs> and I look like it because I'm over there and I'm just scratching and digging and going crazy. <laughs> Here's what I found out about mosquitoes that I actually never really knew. What? Do you know why mosquitoes bite certain people over other people? Well, it's a blood type is what I'd heard. Well, it might be, but this other fact that I recently just learned is they are actually heat seekers. So if you're somebody who's a hot blooded person, they like you. Me too. I was like, well, this is why all these mosquitoes are over here because I'm hot. 
Uh-huh. And I don't mean I'm not bragging. <laughs> right. I'm talking temperature. I'm talking temperature. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Wow. I was okay. like, well, that explains it. I finally know now. Thank you. Yeah. That that seals the deal. Cause I'd heard um blood type. I've heard all sorts of different things, but I've never heard that before. That's interesting. But yeah. why did they choose my left elbow and and over this i don't have hardly any over here maybe it's hotter on that side <laughs> i don't know i've never been a mosquito <laughs> and do you know that it's only female mosquitoes that are the huh. ones that do the biting i didn't know that i read something the other day I said okay that's interesting so they're crabby yeah yeah maybe well maybe it's that time you know <laughs> It could be. It could be. I mean, they bug me too. So that's that's a good conversation right there. It is on the list of things that bug us. Yeah. But I don't yeah. think that's what our podcast is about, is mosquitoes. No. No, because it bugs me when people don't close drawers. Maybe they drawers have drawers or cabinets. That drives me crazy. Maybe there's too many socks in the drawers to close. <laughs> <laughs> that could be. <laughs> Yeah, that, that drives me crazy too, cabinet door. I was calling my grandson today. Oh, uh, you need to come back in here in the kitchen and close the cabinet. Oh, okay. <laughs> so when I was a kid, I was raised in a home where we had some very specific and strict dinner time rules. And so one of them was no elbows on the table. One of them was when we're done eating our dinner, before we get up from the table, we have to say, may I be excused? And then the third thing was when you get up from the table, you push in your chair. If you didn't push in your chair, my dad would call you back and require it. My brother was notorious for not pushing in the chair. And so, and there was a, a moment in time where I was the same notorious for not pushing in my chair. And so the consequence for not pushing in your chair was you had to stand at the table and you have to say, out in out in out in for a, a whatever number of times dad said it, sometimes you had to do it 25 times sometimes it was 10 it would be whatever dad decided <laughs> and so as a result of that it's pushing in your chair and shutting cupboards that's really high up on my list of things that'll bug me and you know the odd thing is i am the worst one about not pushing my chair in <laughs> but yet it's one of my pet peeves so, so go into your psychology education what does that mean <laughs> you're a rebel that's what that means <laughs> that's my formal diagnosis is you're a rebel <laughs> be pretty accurate <laughs> oh boy <laughs> right okay but on a serious note i think that our topic about things that bug us has to do with we could even call it um some misunderstandings about domestic violence some myths about domestic violence some things some ideas that people still perpetuate about domestic violence mm -hmm. that are just really inaccurate yeah and the fact that they are as inaccurate as they are drives us crazy yes yeah and so on our last episode we finished up talking about substance abuse that was one of our topics of conversation mm -hmm. and so there was a part of that that we didn't completely finish and so I'm going to kind of use that as a segue to go into the conversation tonight sure and so we had talked about um one of my pet peeves is when people think and say that substance abuse causes domestic violence and so I feel like in our last episode we addressed that really well mm -hmm. and so if you're listening today and you haven't seen that episode rewind it because you want to go back and, and check that out Right. But the moving forward with that, one of the things that I will say, and it goes right along with it, is there is still um, an overwhelming mentality, I think, of people who say, well, you know, those victims of domestic violence, they're all just undereducated drug addicts. And that sets me off in, a, in such a way. If you go back to the beginning, when you and I first started doing this podcast and we started talking about domestic violence, 
One of the things that we highlighted is domestic violence is no respecter of persons. Right. It doesn't matter what race you are. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter what degree you hold or don't hold. It does not matter what your socioeconomic status is. Domestic is domestic violence is no respecter of persons. Right. And so there was a meeting that I was at one time, and I won't mention where it was at. <laughs> the same <laughs> way I didn't mention what I mentioned. In the, watch the last episode because I didn't mention that either. Um, <laughs> There was a meeting that I was at. The crisis center was making a move and acquiring the property that we currently have. And so as a courtesy to the area that we were in, we went to the town board of aldermen and said, this is what we're planning on doing with the property. We were not met with open arms. People were not necessarily thrilled about the fact that we were wanting to put a domestic violence shelter in the area that we were wanting to put it. So there was a lot of heated conversation, a lot of concerns thrown in our direction, et cetera. But there was a gentleman sitting in the room at one point that made it clear that he was going to come to my rescue and help me with this conversation. And so he stood up and he turned his chair around and he sat on his chair, you know, with his arms on the back of the chair. And he said, let me just get this straight and help you out. Isn't it true that victims of domestic violence are undereducated and drug addicts? And that's what we're inviting into the town. It was challenging for me to respond to that because it's so inaccurate that it's maddening. Of course, I was not in an environment where I could act like I was frustrated or angry about that. Right. So I reduced my answer to, no, you're exactly wrong. That's not accurate at all. Mm-hmm. But it... It's eye-opening to me because I still think that there is a prevalent mentality where people think that Mm -hmm. an educated person would not put themselves in a position to be a victim of domestic violence. No. Let's break that sentence apart. (laughs) An educated person would not put themselves in a position to be a victim of domestic violence. In essence, we're victim blaming. Thank you. When we started this series of conversations, that's the very first thing that we talked about was victim blaming. Mm-hmm. Because what that person is saying is you're choosing to be in that relationship. You're putting yourself in a relationship where you're knowingly going to be physically assaulted, verbally assaulted, emotionally assaulted, sexually assaulted. And because you're undereducated, that's why you're putting yourself in that position. I was in the So top. I have a question for you. Right. So you I was- see- I was just going to say, do you see yourself as an undereducated drug addict? No, no. I only have a high school education, but I was in the top 10% of my graduating class. I don't consider myself dumb. I don't consider myself an idiot. I don't just consider myself undereducated. Definitely not. And having a conversation with you, would I ever say that about you? I don't see you as an undereducated person in any way. (laughs) We've had many, many intelligent conversations over the years, and that's never a thought that's crossed my mind. Well, thank you. And I'm also... I know for a fact you're not a drug addict. I've never done drugs. In fact, I've never even tasted alcohol of any kind. Mm -hmm. None of it. Because my dad was an alcoholic, and so that's the last thing I'm going to do. I already have an issue with food. I don't need to pick up another issue. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I've, I've no, I've never, never consumed alcohol, never taken drugs, nothing. Yeah. And so I can go back over the years of the people that we've sheltered at the crisis center. And I can talk about um, the teacher with the master's degree. I can talk about the woman who came from a multi-million dollar home. Mm -hmm. but had to come into shelter to get away from her abuser. Mm -hmm. And I mean, those are two specifics, but the numbers of people over the years with college degrees and high paying jobs and letters after their names and and titles and all of that. But one thing they all had in common was they had someone who was physically abusing them or emotionally abusing them, sexually Mm -hmm. abusing them you know, going through the whole process. Mm -hmm. And the only way to escape was to go to a place that the abuser was not familiar with, which means coming into shelter. Going into shelter is never going to be someone's first choice. Mm -mm. 
if you have a family that's a close knit family that you can call and say, Hey mom, I need to come home. And the abuser doesn't know where home is. You're going to go home. Mm -hmm. If you have a friend who says, come crash on my couch, you're going to go crash on my couch. If you have the financial means to go to a hotel, you're going to go to a hotel. Here's the problem. We've had a couple of very wealthy people come stay in our shelter. The reason they couldn't go to a hotel is they didn't have any money. All they had was unlimited access to thousands of dollars on credit cards, mm -hmm. which you can't use the credit card because if an abuser is going to try to find you, that's a very easy way to track you. Oh, go get a hotel room. They're mm -hmm. going to find you. Mm -hmm. So there was no other choice but to come into a shelter. Right. And so it just goes all over me. I've had more intelligent conversation sitting in the living room in a support group at the crisis center than I've had in most places. Wow. And it's not because I'm talking. <laughs> it's because, <laughs> or my employees are talking. Right. It's because the residents of the shelter are talking mm -hmm. and they are in no way undereducated people. Wow. Yeah, I believe it. But we like to take a look at that and say, well, obviously, because you're allowing yourself to be hit, you're not very smart. You yeah. don't allow yourself to be hit in an abusive yeah. relationship. And I think <clears throat> in the episode we did prior to this, we talked quite a bit about that. Yeah. But it's very, very frustrating because there's already a tactic of an abuser is to do whatever they can to shatter a person's sense of esteem and worth. How do you do that? You're fat, you're stupid, you're ugly. You go through the list of name comment, calling and degradation and humiliation till you get to the place where when that's constantly hanging over you all of the time, you start to believe those messages about yourself. Yeah. So even someone who's a has a master's in education can come in and say, hey, I'm not very smart. Well, how did you get that master's in education if you're not very smart? Thank you. Mm -hmm. But that is an, a tactic that an abuser will use. Let's put Whoa. you down, and put you down, and put you down. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are still people in the general public at large that Whoa. will look at that and say, yeah, that's got to be true. Because a smarter person would not do that. I'm an intelligent person. And if I found myself in that situation, I would just leave. Mm -hmm. And again, it goes back to the tactics that we talk about over and over again. Yeah. Let me ask you that about the the different um, extremes that you've had, the very wealthy, the very highly educated and so forth. Do they come in as I recall that I came in with, you know, this low esteem and head bowed kind of a thing where they don't feel like they're worth much? Mm -hmm. Yes because that's what the abuser is trying to make sure they do. There was one person incredibly wealthy, came from an incredibly wealthy household. And her situation was so bad. We're in a small town in Taney County, right? Branson's is a pretty small town. Taney County is a pretty small county. Her husband was very well known. Their family was very well known in the area. Her biggest fear was to even say her name or his name. And in fact, before she came into shelter, she made several phone calls and would only talk to me. Wow. And so if I wasn't there, she wouldn't talk to anybody else. She made several phone calls asking, what is the place going to look like? What is the expectation of me going to be? Um, will you tell people that I'm there? And would go through the same list of questions every single time she called. And so finally, we were in a position where, you know, I had assured her where she finally believed when I said, no, we're 100 percent confidential. And I even said to her, you don't have to give me a real name as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. She did eventually verbally give me her real name on the phone. But in the book where we, we keep a log of the people that we shelter, her real name was not in the log. I'm the only one that knew her real name that was there. Yeah. Um, and it was not exactly that like she had been so beaten down and humiliated and degraded and abused but she was still afraid that if somebody knew her name that there would it would get right back to her husband and he would just come and get her mm -hmm. it's a horrible situation it is horrible 
that's one reason I went as went hours away from where I was from was for that very reason. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And she was in a situation where they actually had multiple residences, but she wasn't even comfortable staying in a different residence. Well, I which I don't even... blame her. I mean, I don't blame mm -hmm. her at all, but mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking pretty wealthy if you have multiple residences in one town even. Right. Yeah. Wow. But it doesn't matter. I mean, it doesn't matter. Um, you could have a PhD. I mean, it, your level of education can be that higher. You can be that successful in your business or whatever else. But if the person that you're in a relationship with is determined to, to break your sense of self-worth, they will break it. Yeah. And, and so to answer your question very strongly, yes, there was no sense of self-worth at that point. And then the challenging to make that situation a little bit worse, there was a couple of kids involved and the couple of kids didn't want to leave because they liked the life they were living. Right. And who's going to fault the kids for liking the life that they're living, which doesn't make sense. But so then there was even a, an extra hurdle because I need to be safe, but my kids don't want to come with me. Yeah. Wow. And so again, you know, going into shelter is never someone's first choice. And so, and we'll also see somebody who comes to us with simply the clothing on their back and no money in their pocket. Mm -hmm. And they need a safe place to stay. And that's okay too. Yeah. I and remember. even if, oh, go ahead. Yeah. And no ID. Sometimes they, yes. they escape, but they don't even have their own ID with right. them. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And so I was going to say, even if you come in with no money in your pocket and only the clothing on your back, that does not instantly imply you're undereducated. No. It doesn't instantly imply you're a drug addict. I mean, it's such an overgeneralization. And that's the word I used the first episode when we started talking about this particular topic. We overgeneralize things so badly that you can't put that person in that mold. They don't fit. Mm -mm. And it's not fair to try to do that. To try to paint a picture of what a victim looks like is ludicrous. Yeah. Because if you walked out, go to the shopping mall nearest to where you live and sit on a bench and watch all of the people that walk by for two hours, that's what a victim looks like. Yeah. Because it's very possible. Well, you mentioned in our, our last episode, one in four victims, one in four women are victims of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. If you sit there for two hours and you watch 200 women walk by, Mm -hmm. guess what 50 of those are what a victim looks like yeah if you ever been to a shopping mall one of my favorite things to do is sit and watch people Me they too. all look different <laughs> they do that is one that's the only reason i like to go to a mall is yes. to watch the people i love I to watch shopping. people yes yeah. me too <laughs> So yeah. I think that kind of covers that particular part of the topic, unless you had anything you wanted to add to that. I don't think so. I think we covered that one pretty well. Yeah. Okay. I've got one more. <laughs> okay. We can handle one more, Becky. <laughs> all right. I got one more and this is a biggie for me. And if my employees were all sitting here, when I said the word, they'd all probably be like, oh no, here comes. <laughs> She's going to get on her soapbox. Is it that one? <laughs> it's my soapbox extraordinaire. Uh oh, <laughs> we're in for it, folks. Put yes. your seatbelts on. <laughs> it's the word codependency. Ah, uh -huh. uh huh. Codependency does not apply in an abusive relationship. Really? Codependency exists. Yes. Codependency is a real thing. Uh huh. There are lots of people, unfortunately, who find themselves codependent in mm -hmm. the relationship that they are in. Yeah. We hear it frequently talked about in circles where um, people are raised in homes where alcoholism takes place. Right. We hear the word codependency frequently in those homes. Right. Uh, where, where drug abuse takes place, we hear the word frequently in those homes. Mm -hmm. Codependency does not belong in a conversation about domestic violence, ever. You've got Never. the floor, lady. Explain it. Teach us. <laughs> and so many people... <clears throat> want to use it in the domestic violence setting and it doesn't fit here's why what is your understanding of codependency you tell me 
I took a class on it for a year with the 12 steps and I'm still not convinced that I could explain it to you, but it, it would be like, I'm going to be watching you all the time to see what your reaction is to what I said or to what's going on. And then if you're happy, I'm happy. And if you're upset, then I'm just going to be real quiet and I'm just going to become a wallflower. I'm going to totally base my life off of you and your responses. How close am I to that? I mean, there's elements of that. Sure. <clears throat> What happens if you're in a relationship, a codependent relationship with an alcoholic and they pass out on the couch? Mm. <laughs> now, here I go with my mouth again. I would say just stay there if you want to. <laughs> right. But, basically, but the codependency part of you, not you yeah. specifically, but in general, you in general, mm. would right. feel the need to caretake. Let yes. me caretake for this person. If work calls and says, hey, you were supposed to be at work 15 minutes ago, what are you mm. going to say? I'm going to cover for you. Oh, well, you know, yeah, I'm going to cover for you. I'm going to make an excuse. I'll, I'll put a blanket on you so you don't get cold tonight. And, and yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I guess I won't go to work today because I have to take care of you because yeah. it's more important. Right? right. I mean, and those are just random scenarios that we're creating or whatever else. What is the common denominator in those random scenarios when we're talking about that? I'll answer that one. The common denominator is we have a choice. I'm choosing, if I'm in a codependent relationship with you and I'm giving you the, choi the choice to tell me if I should be happy or tell me if I'm supposed to be upset about this or tell me that I'm sad about this, I make that choice to mimic that behavior. Or if you pass out drunk on the couch and your boss calls and I answer the phone, you didn't tell me to tell my boss I'm sick today or whatever else. I'm passed out. You made a choice to mm -hmm. take care of me to make sure that nothing's going to happen to me. You make that choice. Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. And so in the 12-step programs that you've gone through, you know, everything else that you've talked about, would you, I'm going to call you the expert on that. Would you say that in those scenarios, when you hear the examples that are set and the definitions that are again given, does the person who's being codependent, do they have a choice? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Okay. So then how do you stop being codependent? <clears throat> you make a choice that I want to break out of that mold. And so I'm not going to cover for you anymore. I'm not going to pamper you and take care of you and miss work because of you. You're on your own. Mm -hmm. You made your decision. I'm making mine. And my decision is going to be, I'm not going to follow in your footsteps and be your little shadow and, and cover for you and everything else. Mm -hmm. And so you have the freedom to make that choice. Absolutely. Okay. And that's why the word codependent does not belong in an abusive relationship and domestic violence and codependency do not go hand in hand. And I will argue with every counselor on the planet who says that they do. And there are counselors who say that they do. And the reason that I will argue about that is that, and I may have been goading you to say that, okay, whatever. But what I heard you say was you have a choice. Yeah. If you decide to stop, people go to Al-Anon. And when people go to Al-Anon, what's the goal of Al-Anon? To help you break free mm -hmm. from that codependent lifestyle that you're living with a person who's an alcoholic. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. When you're in a relationship with someone who isn't an abuser, we know this, abusers are motivated to maintain power and control over their victims. What is one of the very first things an abuser does in maintaining that power and control over the victim? They take away their ability to make a choice. Mm -hmm. You will do what I say, when I say to do it, the way that I say to do it. And if you don't, you will pay the consequence, mm -hmm. which is verbal abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, whatever that consequence is, you will pay the consequence. Mm -hmm. In an abusive relationship, the victim does not have a choice. Right. Power and control has been taken away from you. And sadly, mm -hmm. you're at the mercy of the person who's the abuser. Mm -hmm. That's not codependence. If the abuser comes to you and says, you will do this thing at this, you will accompany me to the office dinner tonight at six o'clock. And this is the dress that you will wear. And this is the face that you will put on. And this is the behavior that you will have. That's not codependency if you do it. If you do it, that's called survival. 
Thank you. And there is a huge difference between <clears throat> survival tactics and codependency. Mm -hmm. And it frustrates me. I don't know if you know that. It frustrates me <laughs> so much yeah. when people try to muddy that. Because it, it falls, in my opinion, it falls right back to our original topic of victim blaming. Mm -hmm. We are doing what the abuser says. You could stop doing what the abuser says. If you stop doing what the abuser says, then you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. That's not factual. Right. It's not accurate. And we'll, mm -hmm. you know, I'll use our word escape again. Mm -hmm. You're in a position where the only way you're going to get away from this person is to escape. Mm -hmm. A codependent person living with the alcoholic can say, you know what? I'm out. Or you get out of my house. I'm mm -hmm. done dealing with you. Mm -hmm. And they have the right to do that. Right. A victim of domestic violence could never say to the abuser, you get out of my house. I'm done dealing with you. Because mm -mm. I was in that situation one time. I could not make that decision because it scared me too much. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you would have uttered those words, what do you think would have happened? Oh and I know it's speculation, but what right, right. Would have I, yeah. I, it terrified me. I thought, okay, this is where my physical abuse is going to start and it's going to get ugly and somebody's going to be really beaten up. I really did. Mm -hmm. Or it could get worse. Because it's not safe. Yeah. 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 And so, you know, they they talk a lot um, in substance abuse circles when they're talking about codependence. There's a lot of talk about that word self, tough love. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they uh, got a DWI tonight, and so they got thrown in jail. Tough love says let them sit in jail. Mm-hmm. You make the choice to do that. You could make the choice to go bail him out. You could make the choice to let him sit in jail. Mm -hmm. You make the choice to go bail him out because there is a level of codependency probably that's going along in that relationship. And that makes sense to me. Sure. If you're a victim of domestic violence and your abuser gets a DWI and gets thrown in jail and he calls and says, you come get me and you come get me now, there's no choice there. Right. Because what would happen if you don't? Eventually, he's going to get out of that jail. And he will find you. He will find you. And then you will pay for the price for defying what he told you to do. Mm -hmm. And that's the difference. And so it, it really frustrates me because people don't understand. Again, I'm going to throw that word power differential out again. You're not dealing with two people in a relationship where one person is trying to figure out how to live with this other person who has this addiction that's not what we're talking about right we're talking about someone who has been made to be a victim of the other person and mm -hmm. it doesn't apply that one really gets my shackles up hackles up <laughs> <laughs> and you know what's really interesting there i've i've got on the soapbox many many times in the last 27 years of work at the crisis center I bet you have. and i've I've gotten on a soapbox in support group settings frequently. That's where it comes out the most. And you know what is so encouraging to me is I'll have someone who says, well, my counselor just says I'm codependent. And I'll have a, a much softer, um, much more empathetic, caring conversation with that person and say the same things that we've just talked about. Mm. And the healing those words bring to that person that label of codependent is very challenging for some people to wear mm -hmm. and they don't understand like when you know that you're not doing things on your own free will you're really a prisoner of war with this person yeah. there's a lot of freedom that comes along with the fact that someone will come along and say that's not called codependency that's called survival mm -hmm. And there's a big difference between the two. And okay. I've seen a lot of people that have received that and it's made a huge difference in their healing journey. I'll bet it has. Cause I know I have codependency issues with my mom, for example, but to hear you say that <clears throat> it really, I, I can't remember actually being codependent with my ex-husband when you lay it out like that, no, but it yeah. was survival. Sure. 
because I couldn't cross him. I couldn't yeah. have a different opinion. Right. Mm -hmm. And what's the meaning of co? It would be, I don't know. What is it? It's the two of us. Like if we're in a relationship and we have a codependent relationship, I'm as just as dependent on you as you are on me. Uh, it's okay. Kind of, it's the two of us together in this relationship. Okay. And codependency goes both ways. Okay. It's not just one person in that relationship that's dependent on the other person, co. It's the two okay. of us, right? Okay. Yeah. An abusive relationship, there's no co in an mm -hmm. abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. There's a me and what I tell you to do, and you're beneath me. Mm -hmm. Even by the simple little breaking down of the word, it does not apply. It does not apply. Okay. So Makes that's sense. my spiel about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was good education. And when you said, what's the definition of co, I thought two. And then I thought, well, yeah. I don't know if that's right or not. <laughs> I mean, that's the way that I would look at it. Sure. And so I'm, I, you know, I don't argue with substance abuse circles. Like if I think substance uh, and codependency is a word that's used frequently in mm -hmm. the substance abuse setting. And I'm not, I will never go into the substance abuse setting and say, I disagree with you. I'm no expert on what you're talking about in that respect. Right. But if you want to bring your word into my circle, I reject it because it doesn't <laughs> fit here. It just doesn't fit here. It makes sense. It's like a puzzle. And even though, go ahead. It's like a puzzle piece that doesn't fit where you're trying to shove it into. Right. And so even though we do have some people that come in that may have addiction issues or their abuser may have addiction issues, it still does not apply because it's a completely different type of relationship. Domestic violence is unlike any other crime that exists. It's a standalone, completely different crime. And you can't overgeneralize it into another mm -hmm. setting like that. You just can't. Mm -hmm. It's detrimental. And so I've seen people who intended to do good, trying to help label somebody in that way. And all it did was cause harm. Like it was detrimental to that person in that situation. Because one... When it's explained to you what codependency is, it goes back to what we talked about before as well. The victim does not partner with the abuser in the abuse. Mm -mm. That's not accurate. No. But to throw that word codependency at it, what you're saying is you're partnering with your abuser in your abuse and you're not. Right. You're just, you're just not. Mm -mm. I mean, that's the bottom line. It is. And I think probably one word that I would throw out from our recording tonight would be um, to add in instead of shelter to substitute safe house because we haven't talked about that for a while. Do mm -hmm. you want to talk about the safe house a little bit? I do. That's really been on my mind a lot lately. So let me pull up the safe house app on my phone. So. <laughs> that little icon right there and it's kind of hard to see but you want to type in safe house two separate words when i open that up this is what it's going to look like all these different kinds of abuse and so you've got military legal elder abuse abuse just in general you have an emergency button right there that'll dial your 911 sexual assault, student, native, suicide, human trafficking, safe houses, believe. So let's say I want to look for a safe house. So I'm going to go to that safe house button. And then what's going to happen is all the states are going to pull up. Boy, you really can't see that on there, can you? <laughs> not super well. Yeah, not really well. So let's say I want to go to Alabama. So I open up Alabama. <clears throat> then it'll open it up by county. And then from there, you open it up, it'll drop it down by city and all your information's there. You don't even have to think about it. You don't have to go and research it. You don't, you may not have time. And that's the reason right. that she developed this app. Um, yeah. And so you could have uh, somebody who is, um, okay, let me open that back up again. So addiction she had an addiction one on here 
I'm pretty sure she does. And I'm just not looking at the right topic. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've seen it. Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's just all sorts of help. And you literally, if you have this on your phone, who knows what you're going to encounter? Maybe you're going to encounter that person that's going to be given that symbol that says, I need help. Okay. You pull out your cell phone, you pull, you open up safe house and, you know, you can help them. The first thing I would do is I would call the law, law enforcement. Yeah. I mean, you're on vacation. Say you're on vacation in yeah. California and yeah. you happen to know the county that you're in. You can pull up California and go to that county and here's resources that are instantly at your fingertips. Exactly. Like there's, there's a book that we have that we've got had for years that is a resource directory of all the shelters across the nation. That's like that thick. This is a phone app that you can push on that takes that thick book to it's in your hand and you can go anywhere you want to go. Like it's, it's streamlined the resources so fantastically. Mm -hmm. It is. And that that's just safe houses. Right. That doesn't go into effect with, with uh, if you're military needing help, if you're, you know, elder abuse. I mean, it doesn't, it, there's just so many different things that are on this app. Yeah, it's fantastic. The thought really, process, the thought process that went into developing that is amazing. It is, and I would highly recommend that you folks watch. We've done, I think it's four episodes, maybe five, with um, Eliza Conley Lapine, and she's the the brainchild behind the Safe House app, and they are working very hard to try to get this as just standard. Um, app that's automatically on a new cell phone when you get it so that <clears throat> i love how she says it she says we believe that our app is more valuable to have because it's life-saving than to have a calculator on Definitely. your phone and i agree because you, you can go into your app store and figure out which calculator you want i mean because there's so many out there so yeah, take the calculator off the cell phone and put safe house on. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Every phone should have it. They should. I really believe you never know when you might need it. You may not be a victim of domestic violence. You may not be encountering elder abuse. You may not have addiction problems, but you might meet your new best friend who is or does and they need help. And you can say, here it is. Yep. Didn't even know you needed it, but you needed it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. It is. So I kind of stole your thunder with this. You You can do that. Okay. <laughs> Steal away. Steal Take away. all the thunder you need. <laughs> so if you're if you see somebody maybe out a car window and they're doing this symbol and you're going, what in the world? What that is, think about your thumb as being the victim and they're trapped. They can't get out. And so what that person is saying, I need help. I'm in a really bad situation. Help me, please. It's a cry for help. So if you see this, call 911. Do what you can to try to intervene, okay? Because they're going to be doing that over and over and over again. We want to, Becky and I are passionate that we get the word out as to what this means and what you can do to help. What are some of the options they could do? Let's say you're walking downtown in your downtown area and somebody's walking like this and they're kind of, and, and they're doing it, they're, they're doing it real up close so that nobody around them can see it, but they're making that symbol um, what can you do? What are some of the options? There's a million options, but what are some of the options you could do? I mean, the first one is acknowledge, oh my gosh, this person needs help. Mm -hmm. Somebody has to make that acknowledgement. Mm -hmm. So then in your mind, what does somebody need help mean? Most of us will be like, somebody call 911. Somebody needs help. I mean, right? Yeah. So it's not a physical, like a uh, health emergency, medical crisis but someone is communicating to you that you're in crisis. Mm -hmm. And so the very first thing when someone's in crisis is you get crisis help. Mm -hmm. Call the police. If you don't want to call the police, you could actually be brave enough, and it may not be a good idea, 
which you could go up to the person and say, hey, do you need some help? If they're with an abuser, it's a bad idea, but we don't know that. Right. But it would be at least an acknowledgement of, I know something's going on here. Mm -hmm. Then if these sporadic behavior from the person that you're with, you definitely call 911 because mm -hmm. you've had that interaction. Right. Um, I mean, that's the main thing that I think is we call for help. That's who we call is those that are committed to serve and protect. <laughs> <laughs> Let me throw out an or idea. Say, maybe you're with somebody and you're like, hey, this woman needs help. You're a big guy. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I mean, you're on the street and it's a stranger. You don't really know how to get involved, but mm. if you're a big guy. Maybe you want to get involved in that <laughs> way. I mean, I'm, I'm never advocating for violence, but. No. Mm -mm. I'm, I'm thinking, could you, what do you think about this? You walk up to that person, you go, well, hi, and you make up a name. Right. Hi, I haven't seen you in a long time. Can we, let's go in here and get a cup of coffee and sit down and talk. I mean, pull them away. Who knows? I mean, maybe their abuser is a block behind them. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and so then, you know, that five minute window that maybe you have, do you need help? What do you need help with? What can I do? Yeah. And if they're able to say that to you, sure, that mm -hmm. can work as well. Or if you see them with somebody, you could do the same thing to the abuser or the kidnapper or, you know, or the trafficker. Hey, I haven't seen you forever and distract them and pull them aside Ooh. and the victim can take off running. I mean, it, it could go both ways I like to where that. just that instant moment of distraction, mm -hmm. that person has the opportunity to run away. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. So, I mean, if, it, if we're talking a traffic victim, trafficking victim and they start running away, the odds are that person's not going to chase them if it's a public place mm -hmm. or if they do, they know the cops are going to get called or whatever else. And so it may be, well, if I lost one, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. there might be that mentality there. You just don't know. You don't. And recently in an episode, I think it was the one on victim blaming and I was a pedestrian and I observed a guy beating up his girlfriend and I didn't call the police because they were, the proximity was so close. And I thought, nah, I'd better not be caught on the phone. And I said that they came walking by me. Well, she came walking by me first. He didn't want to look like he was chasing her because it was very well populated where I was, a lot mm -hmm. of people around. And so he kind of casually goes walking behind her you know he's trying to catch up mm -hmm. you know but he didn't want to look like he's running he didn't yell out her name you know hey robin stop or whatever like that you know he he just kind of made it look real cool and casual and i thought uh-huh yeah that's real cool and casual dude mm -hmm. yeah I mean, the main thing why I think that hand signal is so important is just encouraging people to get involved. Yes. Mm -hmm. Think about if that were your sister oh, or yeah. your daughter, your mm -hmm. your grandma. I mean, think about, you know, that person. Yeah. Wouldn't you want somebody to get involved and help them in, in that situation? Absolutely. You know, the thing is, is one of the things that we encourage people to do when we're doing domestic violence education is we're encouraging people as a community to take a stand against domestic violence. And so the way that we take a stand against domestic violence is together. Yeah. And we link our arms, there's safety in number, not on my watch, you're not that's not going to happen here. Right. And so that hand signal is a call to arms, so to speak, of let's take a stand. Mm -hmm. We're not going to allow this to happen on my watch. If I see this, I'm not going to turn my head because turning my head is um basically giving you silent permission to keep doing what you're doing mm -hmm. and if you're wanting to take a stand against it you don't give silent permission to keep doing what you're doing right help in some way in whatever way you're capable of helping mm -hmm. definitely even if it's you're you know shopping and you go into the store and say hey i think that girl's in trouble do you have a phone can you call mm -hmm. maybe you don't want to do it yourself right but you ask the store owner to do it you know or, or whatever else yeah. I think the more you sit and think about it, the more ways you can come up with. 
Oh, absolutely. I'll never forget. I was working a job graveyard shift and somebody was banging on the door outside and it's pitch black. It's in the middle of the night. I'm like, what is going on here? And it was a gal and her little girl and she had just escaped. The little girl was in her nightgown. I don't remember. I don't recall what the woman was wearing. So I think she must've been wearing street clothes. And she said, could you please hide me? My abuser is right behind me. He's coming down the block. Would you please hide me? Put us in a safe place. And, you know, you just, you kind of go with your gut when you see something like that. Mm -hmm. With your gut feeling of what you should do. Yeah. Did you let her in? I did. (laughs) Well, my boss might not be real happy about it, but I'm coming from that situation. So I totally get it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. So I hid her around the corner where the nobody would see. And it was a brick wall. So yeah. Only, only a tornado could break through that. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And that poor little girl. You know, I mean the the kids, we've talked about it before, but the kids are they don't have a choice. They go right. where the parents, you know. Uh, yeah. take them or don't take them or whatever they are like an unsung victim that sure. we don't really talk about much yeah absolutely mm-hmm. that could be another topic someday could be mm-hmm. write that down <laughs> <laughs> becky we appreciate all of your education and um that you're taking all these years of experience and and letting us know and it's it's good to hear your story of how this whole passion of doing abuse education started. It's good to hear that and to to know where that came from. Yeah. We appreciate you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> well, folks, just remember, no matter where you are in the process, you're always free to soar. Mm-hmm.